welcome everybody. I hope uh, you can hear me. Um, welcome to our monthly appointment at the Hebrew University webinar series. Our aim through the webinars is to introduce our European friends to the people who make us Israel's leading university. Today, we have the pleasure to hear from Professor Avram Kluger. He is one of the, our most prestigious researchers. He will speak on what is listening. Professor Kluger is a professor of, of uh, organizational behavior at the School of Business Administration at the Hebrew University. Professor Kluger studies the effects of listening and feed forward on performance, attitudes, and well being. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to have you in audience. Um, my name is Avi Kluger. I was born in uh, 1958. I was the first uh, born in both sides of the family um, of Holocaust survivors. I'm also married um, Zahava, my wife, who is also um, a daughter of two Holocaust survivors. And soon it will become clear how this may be related uh, to listening and my choice to study. So, starting the age of 17, I started to feel a pain in my throat. And the pain was so hard, so harsh, that I chose to cope with it by ignoring it as much as I could. In my 20s, when I tried to relax and say I tried to do yoga, I felt as if somebody is putting a nail inside of me in one side and coming out from the other side. And in this way, in my late 20s, I found myself studying and working 80 hours a week and later on marrying and um, helping uh, raise a family, keeping myself busy all the time. So in this way, I didn't know what's going on from uh, this part of me and below. And it was working more or less, but all the time on the move. In those years, I started to research the destructive effect of feedback on performance. How can we, with uh, performance appraisal in organizations or grades in school and universities, destroy performance, even when the feedback is positive? And when I was uh, 46 years old, I went into a crisis. And the crisis was both personal and professional. In the professional side, I started to ask myself, what are you doing? So what if you know that feedback is destructive? So what if the academia claps hands and saying, wow, this is really nice work. Nobody seriously took you in ministries of education, in corporations, in militaries, and people just continue to do exercise of feedback without being aware of the potential damage that it carries. And I thought to, uh, to try something else. I was serious about trying an alternative career outside of academia. And in those years, I allowed myself to experiment with variety of things. It started with something called appreciative inquiry. Uh, I invited um, a consultant to my group of PhD students, and she instructed us to interview each other with the following question. Could you please tell me a story about a time at work during which you felt that you are energized? I told such a story and then I became very sad because I realized 
that most of my work was trying to prove to, to other people how smart I was, not the thing that I really cared about or the thing that I found interesting. And I also realized that I had very little happiness in every other sphere of my life. So I allowed myself following that to try things such as one year of storytelling classes, one year of psychodrama. I experimented with Zen Buddhism, with rebirthing, with uh, something called performing the world. Uh, at age 48, I started to take voice classes to sing and more and more and more. And I started to change dramatically. So dramatically that uh, my wife suspected that I'm becoming relate religious. Uh, she noticed that the tone of my voice changed. And former student of mine that met me uh, were surprised and asked, where is this arrogant uh, professor with the uh, necktie and jacket, like seeing, thinking so much, so highly of himself? Where did he go? So I'm not saying he completely disappeared, but people noticed that something happened to him. So I started to ask myself, what happened? And this change was very positive for me. It was hard to go through that, but very positive. So first I realized that I was studying for 20 years feedback, which is about telling other people how they should behave. This is in light of the criticism that I heard from my father and my mother, which was common also to my wife and many other people in my generation that received a lot of negative feedback of the form that I would come home with a grade of 98% and my father would ask, where did you lose the two points? I would come home with a grade of 100% and we said, okay, the teacher made a mistake. You'll see next time because I know you even better. And so I realized that I was studying what was really painful for me for so many years. I was trying to tell the world, hey, telling people how they should improve is not always a good idea. It could be extremely painful. In those uh, experiences that I went through, I also became aware of memories that left me for 40 years as if I completely forgot the rages that my father had beating me with his belt that maybe were not different than how he was beaten in Germany, in Germany during, the, during the war in the camps for misdeeds like as uh, having a knife in his shoe. And then also broken memories of potential sexual abuse by a babysitter came to me, think as, as if I'd forgotten them for 40 years. So then I became curious, how can it happen? that the person in his midlife changes so dramatically. And I started to ask myself, what was common to all the experiences I went through? And the answer I gave to myself was that I was so lucky to have so many people listen to me, whether telling stories or singing or being interviewed. And I realized that expressing myself to somebody who was keen in listening was a healing process. And then I reached the decision that I want to first learn how to be a better listener every day in my life. And although I'm in this journey more than 10 years now, my family members can testify that I have a lot to learn before they'll be satisfied with the way I listen to them. Um, so what I'm trying to, trying to tell that this is a, a decision for life to learn to improve your listening skill every day. The second decision that I reached is to learn how to invite people to the same journey and in fact, uh, next month I'm starting, not for the first time, to teach here at the Hebrew University uh, an MBA class, Masters of Business Administration, uh, in our international program 
all devoted to the skill of listening and management. And what I learned about it, that the best way to teach people to listen is to listen to them. Just to create exercises and experiences and spaces in which people stop their daily hairy and rush and sit in front of uh, another student in the class and just listen. Not just listen with a lot of instructions, but feeling that someone else is really interested in what you have to say. And then I made the third decision to become a researcher of listening and to try to be among the leaders in the world in advancing this, uh, this the understanding of what is listening, how does it work? Why don't we listen well? What could be done? And what are the consequences of listening? And since this is a webinar, this is very hard for me to demonstrate how I invite people to the experience of being listened to. For that, you may need to see me when you visit the Hebrew University for a one-on-one -on -one or in another uh, format. Um, but what we can do today is I'll share with you some of my learning, some of my research uh, about listening, and then I would listen to your questions and ho hopefully I will be able to demonstrate a little bit of what I've learned in how to listen well, which I sometimes can and sometimes cannot, but hopefully today it will be on the successful side of it. So I'm now gonna go through my slides on your screen and start with my conclusion after 10 years of research. This is what I found. One equals two. And I'll spend the next uh, 25 minutes or so trying to uh, prove this equation. First, let's start with what is listening? Let's define what it is. The, the truth is that it's extremely difficult to define what it is, but it's easy to know uh, when you are being listened to. That is, if you want to know whether you listen well, the only thing you need to, uh, to know is what other people honestly think about how you listen to them. And by the way, different people will have different opinion about you. And it's not because you are a good or poor listener, it's because you are good or poor listener depending on the company of whom. But trying to break it down to components, the speakers will look whether you pay attention, whether you show signs of understanding of their in real meaning, and whether they feel that you are on their side. Are you empathic towards them? Are you non-judgmental? It's not necessary that you agree with them, but are you trying to be on their side and to promote their well-being rather than to, to prove that you are smarter, stronger, more beautiful than they are or whatever? Uh, people are very sensitive to that. And only if all these three things happen, uh, the miracles I'm gonna talk about soon would happen. In fact, it will be easier for me to define what is listening by defining what listening is not. That is, when you say to people, yes, I'm with you, go ahead, while you are playing with your phone, people know that you're not listening. And even if it's an old type of phone, when they hear the computer clicking while you are, uh, they are talking to you, and when you are busy cutting onion uh, in the kitchen, while well, supposedly you're listening, uh, this is not the type of listening that will create the miracles I'm talking about. Yes, this type of listening may be sufficient to agree that you're gonna meet tomorrow evening uh, for dinner, but it's not be enough to create the outcomes I'm gonna talk about. Listening is also not when you say, oh, I know what you mean. Usually when you say, I know what you mean, you mean to say, I've had enough listening to you. I'm tired of you. Let me talk now. 
It's not that you understood. And if you find yourself saying to your children or to your subordinates or anyone else, I've, but I've told you a thousand times, it's a sure sign that you try to say something for a thousand times, you know it's failing, and you're going to do it one more time. And just an interesting question, what would have happened if instead of saying, you will stop and ask, why don't you do these things? I'm curious to find out. What are your reasons? And also, when you give advice, when nobody asks you for, for it, it's usually because you get tired of the pain of the other person and you want to solve the issue and to finish off this conversation so you can talk now. Um, so I'm not saying like this quotation that the people sensible enough to give good advice are usually sensible enough to give none. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's an art of giving advice in the form of a question in the right timing when the person completely exhausted him or herself in talking and ask for your opinion specifically. And when you feel like this inside, that you feel like, oh, I wish this person will just shut up. I cannot stand them. You cannot listen. If you don't learn to meditate, to calm yourself down, to start breathing while you feel like this, you won't be able to listen. So this is like what listening is, the behavior is all about. But let's see what happens with it. I'm going to start with what consultants are saying about listening in every sphere of life. And the first book I'm going to talk about is the, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Uh, actually, according to Wikipedia, it was sold over 30 million copies already 10 years ago. So this is the most sold management book probably in history. One of the seven habits that Stephen Covey found of people who were extremely successful as politicians, as business people, or as, as spiritual leaders is what he called seek to understand before you seek to be understood. So in business, uh, these people will walk into a boardroom and would let everyone else uh, say what's in their mind before they express their opinion. In a different uh, sphere of life, Harvard Hendricks developing the method of uh, uh, fixing up marriages, saying the following things about marriages, that the honeymoon for most people will turn into a cold war. It's not a question of if, it's an only a question of when six months, three years, it's going to happen. And when it's going to happen, what can you do apart from a divorce? And his suggestion, you need to learn to listen to your partner. Now, I want to say a few things about it. First, please, if you listen to this webinar, do not go out tonight to your partner and say that Professor Kluger said that you need to listen to me because I didn't say. Um, the only thing I can say, you can go home and say, today I want to listen to you. But there is a little problem with this suggestion. Because what my wife wants to tell me about me is exactly the last thing in the world that I want to hear. Nobody is such an expert like our partner in making us crazy. Nobody at work is so efficient in one look, in one comment, in making us, uh, our blood boil. And Hendrix is saying, well, there is no two ways around it. You need to learn to listen to these painful things. And with that, you will need to change because your partner usually sees the things that you are blind to and really will improve your well-being if you'll attend to. Then in a different uh, domain, 
Faber and Maslisch already 40 years ago wrote a bestseller that is being reprinted, How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. Will talk. And if anyone asked if his or her child or a child coming back from school or kindergarten, how was their day and got the uh, really detailed answer. Okay, fine. Uh, Faber and Maslisch are inviting these parents to see that we trained our children to talk to us this way because we don't trust their wisdom to solve their own problems. And when they share problems with us, we jump to solve them instead of listening to how they think to cope about them. So just an example, a kid come home, somebody beat, beat, beat me in school. And a typical parent will say, oh, so where is the phone number of your teacher? I want to talk to the, not the teacher, where is the phone number of the principal? I need to talk to the principal. I'm not going to allow this to happen again. The next day, the child goes to school and he's being beaten twice and will come home and the parents will ask, so how was your day today? It's fine because the child does, does not want to be embarrassed in front of his friends with uh, not knowing how to deal with the problem in class. And in fact, if you ask that child, so what happened? He may say, well, he beat me. And why did he beat you? Well, I cursed him with words that I don't dare repeat for to you. So if the parent would ask them, so what do you think to do? Is it possible that the child would say, you know, that?" Maybe with this child, I should watch my mouth. You know that perhaps I shouldn't use these words. We don't give a chance for this possibility to emerge because we are so quick to solve the problem of our child. Highly recommend the book. And it was tested experimentally in training of parents of teenagers and the teenagers whose parents were in the, in the experimental group reported that their parents are much better behaved at home than the parents uh, of the children in, that were in the control group. But it goes on and on. The best, maybe one of the most important books in negotiation coming from the Harvard Negotiation Project, Difficult Conversations, towards the end of the book suggests that if you want to become a really good negotiator, you will need to become a listening leader. Uh, and let's move on. A psychiatrist named Shea asked the question, how come that 300,000 American soldiers came back from Vietnam with mental illness? And what to do about it? And his answer was, it happened because of betrayal. The government betrayed the army who betrayed the soldiers and when you're a soldier, they don't trust his, his uh, commander anymore in the field and you lose a friend be, that walked next to you and uh, stepped on the mine, you, become a, you became a candidate to lose your sanity. And people like that came home and told how they hung dead bodies of Viet Congs on trees as decoration for Christmas. And the civilians hearing this story saying, are you crazy? Are you representing the US of A? And what Shea is saying, this is a second betrayal of people who don't understand what happened to them, judgmental. He says the only hope to start curing these people and prevent them to becoming drunkards who drink and beat their wives and their children and transmitting the trauma to the next generation, the only hope is to listen to their story, not to tell them, oh, you have a, you have a post-traumatic, uh, you're post-traumatic or you have this or you have that. Just listen to the story. And it goes on and on. Uh, the person who developed the field of organizational consulting from MIT, Edgar Schein, wrote a few years ago when he was already 83 years old, based on his 60 years of career in consulting. And the title tells it all. Humble Inquiry, the gentle art of asking instead of telling. And the NON, 
a doctor at Harvard who lost her mother to a uh, medical negligence uh, is noting that medical errors are the number three cause of death in the United States. And she's warning families that because the doctors don't listen to your family member, he or she may die. And you have to make sure that they listen because they don't have the time and don't, not the inclination often that could risk the life of your loved ones. On the other side, Daniel Offrey from uh, New York is writing to doctors that if they don't listen, they're actually not following their uh, oath of the doctor. Because if they only do the check on whatever the computer asks them to do or the hospital asks them to do, they don't know the story of the, the person and will fail really to do the right diagnosis or help for the person. It goes on and on. So now I want to move uh, more to the more academic thoughts about listening. And I'll start with what theoreticians are saying about listening. Um, first argument is that the listener makes the speaker speak clearly. If you have a good listener, you will use less, um, you know, uh, yeah, all sorts of speech disfluencies disappear when you feel that somebody really listens well to you. If this is the case, another researcher argued that because Good listeners make you speak more fluently and tell more eloquently what happened to you in life on an everyday basis. Then uh, what happens is that you remember not what happened to you, but you remember what you told the other person and the experience of telling it. Uh, to prove this point, this researcher wrote students to the laboratory and ask one of them to play a very interesting computer game and then to go and tell it to another uh, student. The other student was randomly asked to listen well as a good friend does and the other half were asked to count how many times your friend produces the letters TH and if you count correctly you get extra money for participation in this experiment. And after the experiment, she asked the people to tell how much they enjoy tell, uh, playing this computer game and whether they will um, recommend it to a friend. And lo and behold, those that had a person sitting like this, as if listening to them but not understanding a word because they were counting the age, say they didn't like the game, but they played the very same game. It's only they remember the experience of telling about playing the game. And in this way, in a slow process, the collection of listeners that we have around us determine how much, how well we know ourselves, how much our self-knowledge is related to the real experiences that we have. And children that grew up like myself this Holocaust survivor that were barely coping with day-to-day -day life uh, tended to have impoverished parts of knowing of their self, knowing what they really like, choosing correctly what is good for their well-being, not for impressing others. If this is not enough, Carl Rogers, over 70 years ago, one of the greatest psychologist of the 20th century, perhaps only second to Freud in his influence on clinical psychology, was saying that if you listen in the way that I described in the very beginning to a person, um, without judgment, more and more, eventually you will see a transformation of the person up to a personality change. And I would say, Personality change? Are you crazy, Mr. Rogers? But I don't say it because it happened to me. I know it's possible. And the last argument is 
that when you offer listening, you create political change. Wherever you magnify his or her voice, political change will follow. And these arguments were there years before the Me Too movement started. When you allow certain stories, poli deep political change can come out of it. It depends to what we are listening to. So, um, next, I want to uh, show you, these were the theories, I want to show you the numbers. And to show you the numbers, I did meta-analysis. Meta in meta-analysis, I collected every empirical paper that has numbers relating something to listening. And I organize them uh, based on different topics. And I'm going to show you the results. And I will explain the most complex graph uh, that we're going to see today. So here is a graph. And on the x-axis, you see correlations. Correlation is a unit of relationship between two variables. In this set of studies, about third of the things are based on experiments, but I can uh, transform it to correlation. Now, it's about 900 correlations that are being summarized in this table. And depending on topic, it's between 10,000 people to 150,000 people that make up each bar. First, I want to explain the vertical bar in black. This is the median correlation in experiments in social psychology in the 20th century, over 8 million people and 25,000 different experiments. It suggests that everything stronger than 0.21, which you see here, is above the median. It's a relatively strong relationship. The second bar here, about 0.26, it's the uh, point above which only one-third of the correlations were, that were found in my field of industrial psychology over 30 years of research, over 150,000 uh, correlations collected from over 300 million people. Anything above this point should be considered strong. So let's see what's the support for the theory that listener affect the quality of speech. No doubt it has relative to what is possible in the social sciences. It's an amazing strong relationship. Now let's see what is the relationship between listening and quality of relationship between people as hypothesized by Carl Rogers that influence the well-being of people. Uh, things like trust, etc. Again, very strong. Uh, I'm going to ignore environment for a second. I'm going to go to cognition. Here, I looked at things, including research that came from my own lab, with the idea that if you listen to a person, you change their attitudes, you change the way they think in a dramatic way. And one of those I want to uh, demonstrate. Um, based on Carl Rogers, a former student of mine, Gaitz Chakov, uh, and I suspected that if you want to change the opinion of someone, the only thing you need to do is to listen to them. They will come up with a counter argument from their inside after a few minutes of telling you why they think in one direction. They'll come up with the argument for the opposite direction. I will give you just one example how we tested it. We brought students to the lab here at Mount Scopus, and we asked them for their, pol their political leaning, whether they are leftist or rightist on the political uh, divide in Israel. Then we let them read a newspaper article about a decision of the Israeli Supreme Court to return corpse, corpses, bodies of dead uh, suicide bombers back to their families. 
And after they read it, we asked them to tell another student what they think um, about the decision of the Supreme Court. Only the third of the student, we paired them with a student we told to uh, pretend as if they are listening, but not really to listen to him or to her. A third of them, we told them, listen like you listen to a good friend. And third of them, we took students from the School of Social Work who were trained for 80 hours in listening to be the listeners. And we let the person talk for 12 minutes about their opinion. And then we asked them to rate how much positive things they see in the decision and how much negative things they see in the decision. And based on these two types of answers, we can calculate whether a person is an extremist, seeing only the positive or only the negative, and that's it. There is only one side to the issue, or whether they can tolerate complex thinking, complex attitude. And in every experiment that we have done, and this is the average of similar experiments, uh, people who are paired with a good listener become more moderate and less extreme. Think about the political problems in Europe, in the USA, in Israel, and think how much television programs and political leaders talking uh, without listening affect these consequences that all of us are paying a heavy price for. Another cognition that we looked here is like satisfaction, satisfaction with the job, satisfaction with the doctor, everything, people become more satisfied. And so much so that the correlation of my supervisor is listening and job satisfaction is about 0.4. It's part of this average. And in contrast, the correlation of job satisfaction with salary is about 0.15 around here. So listening is so much more effective by the supervisor in creating job satisfaction. But think, how many organizations you know that are bothered by what type of bonuses we should give? What is the uh, best incentive scheme? And how much payback they get from the best incentive schemes that they can have? Versus how many organizations do you know that invest in training everyone in listening, including the managers. And if they do it, what is the benefit they're gonna uh, get from it? Next, I'm looking whether listeners are better performance, performers. And lo and behold, yes, better listeners are better performers. They sell more. If they are doctors, they have less um, lawsuits against them. If there are school principals, the children have better academic achievement. If they are managing a, a fast food chain, the company reported that they have less accidents. Every domain that was tested shows positive correlation. They are strong and they are as strong as intelligence in uh, predicting performance and stronger than any other known personality trait. Then, Let's see if performance, as Carl Rogers thought, predicts well-being, like it reduces depression, anxiety, and coping in general. Well, it may seem to you that this effect is weaker, but it's still on the strong side, and it is stronger than the effect reported in meta-analysis of drugs for depression, for example. That is, listening is a medicine that is as effective, if not, if not more, than pharmaceutical drugs. So with all these benefits, we can ask, how can we create it? Is it a personality or is it something in the environment that we can control? Now you can look here in the environment. Here I have the effect of training on listening the or the effect of lack of distraction on listening. Pretty powerful. Is it related to personality? Yes, but weakly. Women listen better than men, but it's a weak association. People high in a trait called agreeableness are better listener, but it's relatively weak. 
my conclusion, therefore, that I'm coming towards is that one good listener creates benefit for two people because the listener um, will be a better performer, uh, the speaker will be more moderate, happier, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we can ask, what can you do? Your first three steps, if you care about listening, well, you can do something that I didn't do with you, is just go home tonight to your partner or someone else, put your phone on a timer and say for the next five minutes, I'm only listening, I'm not gonna say a word. Tell me, please, and see what happens. And I actually tried it with two donors of the Hebrew University, and I sent them to listen to each other at home, and that's what they wrote me back. The husband wrote, this exercise remind me once again of why we dated and then got married 47 years ago. The wife wrote to me, I enjoyed having five or more minutes to explain my thought without any interruption. It can create miracles, but it's hard to practice. The other thing that you can do is when a person uh, finished talking, ask what else. This is my butcher in Machne Yehuda in Jerusalem. Whenever I asked for one kilo of chicken, he would say, and what else? And why not, when a person finished talking, instead of giving your two cents, first ask, is there anything more? And the other thing that will make you, people listen to you, is tell your stories and ask people to tell you stories, not opinions, tell stories. And last, if you go this path of becoming a better listener, forgive yourself because you'll make errors every day and a lot of them. Just every time you pay attention to an error, be glad that you caught it and maybe strive to improve more. So I'm leaving you with the question, what will be your first step? I don't know what it is. And I'm concluding that this wisdom is already in the Old Testament. Uh, in the book of uh, Proverbs, it is said, in Hebrew, I would say first and then in English. Or in English, counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Once a rabbi was asked, how come that everyone that asks for advice from you comes out so satisfied? He said, I read in Proverb. The people ask, what did you read? And he said, every one of us have an advice or a counsel for the problems that we have right now. And the value of this advice is like deep water. And deep water should be understood in the context of the Holy Land, where here without a well or a cistern, in the dry summer, you will die. So what it's saying that the advice that I have for myself, I know what I, the, the solution is, it's like oxygen, it's like water for me to live on. But a man of understanding will draw it out. That's the other person who listens to me and lets the advice for me to myself to come out. So, I want to wish all of us and that we will learn every day starting today to become a little bit more people of understanding. I thank you and uh, I will be glad to take your uh, questions. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Kluger, and uh, please you can raise uh, your digital hands and I'll let you speak, or you can write your questions on the uh, chat. Okay, Christelle, she's thanking you very much for Thank this you. great moment. Yeah. You can also read it. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm gonna read. Uh, From uh, Christelle to all panelists, thank you 
very much for this great moment. Thank you, Christelle. Okay, from Lionel Perez. Um, what do you think are the best tools for actively of active listening? Um, I want to say the thing that, like Rogers, I don't think that there are any best tools. Uh, the tools are important, but they are secondary to the intention. And the listener, the speaker will feel whether you reach the decision to create a space for the other person. Are you sufficiently relaxed, sufficiently uh, making yourself available for the other person? And whatever uh, technique you will use, whether it will be paraphrasing or useful questions um, is important, but the importance is to put yourself in the space. So I would say that the most important tool is your own mindfulness to whether you're really listening and to open your heart to whatever is coming from the other person. Then Lionel also asks, um, are there objective ways to rate the effectiveness of the following? Mirroring, looping, paraphrasing. In fact, uh, my meta-analysis suggests that uh, Training improves all of these, um, but what really drives the experience is not whether you look in the eyes of the other person, or you paraphrase or things like that. It's a holistic perception is the other person is with me. So therefore, I think that the best way to do it is just a simple question or simple questionnaire. And also my team developed two such questionnaires that are highly reliable to measure perception of listening of one supervisor, of one's partner, doesn't matter where. And I think this is the best way to measure rather than the behavior of the listener, measure the perception of the speaker because this is where the results are gonna happen. Uh, I will let uh, Mr. Aydan to speak uh, for you. Yes. Okay, Mr. Aydan, you can speak. You are unmuted. Yes, in fact, I thank you, Professor. It was really a very interesting lecture. I appreciate a lot. My question is, you talk of uh, Holocaust history. And is the pers personal, uh, is pro personal proper history a big obstacle uh, to, to, in fact, to be a, a food and good li li listener? And can you comment on this? How can we solve it? How can you can you can can we solve, in fact, all the obstacles of our personal education to 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 pass over that and and be a better listener? Um, I think that creating a safe place for people to share trauma is the only way to help people with poor beginning or with trauma to become better listeners on their own. So sometimes it requires, say for a soldier, sometimes they need somebody who was exposed to similar traumas like themselves because they feel trusted that they will not, uh, they will not ridicule them, they will understand them. So finding somebody who can listen to your story and understand you is the, the only path for recovery. And I think that people who had trauma and recovered partially could become excellent listeners. And in fact, I'm working with a lot of people who are trainers in listening all over the world. And when I hear their stories, I know that they were traumatized uh, severely in a variety of ways. I can mention some ways. Uh, uh, one friend of mine from the Netherlands, uh, her mother almost uh, murdered a neighbor, uh, was mentally sick, uh, never told her who her true father was, although she knew. And th things like that that make the beginning of a life of a child terrible. So, and people that were raped by family members uh, 
again and again, but they learn through exercise with dancing and other to listen to their body, listen, being listened to other places, found a safe place when they talk, can talk about what happened to them, then they themselves become outstanding listeners and healers. Thank you. We have a, a question for Mr. Cohen. How do you deal with people who cannot hear some things that are difficult for them to accept? They cannot. So then uh, there is uh, my, something I learned from uh, 1001 Night of Arabia, some passage they're saying, and there is no point in repeating your point. Uh, once you said it once, if the person is not available, the only thing you can do is listen to them. Maybe then they will uh, become more open. I know that I myself became open to receiving feedback only when I felt, uh, before age 46, for example, I didn't know that the students loved me. I was not impressed with the teaching evaluation that were high. I couldn't feel it. Um, it's only once I felt that people love me, I was able to hear what they have to say to me. So before the person is ready, before the person feel loved, uh, there is waiting to do and patience. There's no shortcut. Okay, we have uh, time for one more question. Okay, uh, Mr. Meloch, um, you can talk, you can ask. Uh, okay, maybe you can speak now. Okay, we're going... Um, Again, uh, Mr. Perez, he's asking, uh, how does one evaluate the correlation between listening and one memorization to conviction? Okay. So uh, one researcher argued that, um, so I, I'm not clear from this question, it's memory of whom, of the speaker or of the listener? If it's the listener, um, then um, like, it's not like listening to a lecture because listening to a lecture and memorizing it is more related to intelligence. I'm talking about memory uh, that even if it's not that accurate of a, but give the feeling for the other person that he or she is understood. Uh, of course, it requires some memory, but it's not an exceptional memory. On the other hand, uh, the research that I described argued, found that uh, I talked about those students that were playing computer game. They were invited to the laboratory one month later. And those that were not listening well did not remember the details of the game. They, they were just had to write down what do they remember from the game. Not listening, don't remember. But this effect was not uh, replicated a sufficient amount of time, so I'm not sure of that. About conviction, um, again, it's about listener or the speaker. And I think the conviction of both goes down. I'll give you one example. There was one qualitative study in the British uh, prison system studying people that are uh, imprisoned for life, for usually murder. And they volunteer to the Good Samaritan to become licensed listeners in the jail. In the sense that if somebody feels that they are going berserk, that they are losing it, they can call those trained people to lower suicide rates and self-harm in jail. And these people said that after years of doing it, um, they started to own their own crime, to feel remorse, and they felt that they are drip by drip changed to become more mellow people. 
In terms of speakers, I found with my student in the experiments that when people are being listened to, they no longer want to share their attitudes with other people to convince them, but they only want them to know what they believe, but they can tolerate it that the other person believes something else. Uh, so these are my two cents about the correlation between listening, memory, and conviction. Okay, we can try once more uh, to let Mr. Meloch to speak. Yes, you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I'm Gabriel, I'm Mrs. Meloch, it's okay. Sorry, uh, okay. No, it's okay. Would you say that in a musical concert, it's, uh, this applies as well? There's a relationship between the musicians and the audience. And when the audience is open and a good listener, you think the performance is better? I'm sure it is. I'm too. Uh, because I mean, the, uh, anyone who performs unconsciously uh, register what's going on with the audience. And the more the audience is with them, the more the magic is being created. So it's actually, it's both sides are responsible for it. It's not only the performer, it's also the audience is responsible. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much to everybody. Um, we were finished our time, but you will all receive the recordings and I'm sure um, that Professor Kluger can answer your question by mail. You can write me and I will um, forward him your mails. And uh, whenever you will be here at the university, we will be happy to uh, create the contact and you can meet Mr. Kluger too. With pleasure. So thank you very much to everybody and uh, we'll meet in the next webinar in one month from uh, now. Thank you. Have a nice evening.